So you know that Survive the Jive fella, that Tom Rosell, he's got a great channel, really knows his onions, a gentleman and a scholar. I says to him, I says, Oi Tom, fancy a chat sometime? And he was all like, don't tempt me, because I'll do it. And I was all like, let's do it then. No, it, it didn't go down like that, of course, but he was good enough to give me a bit of his time. Um, so with no further ado, here's my conversation with Survive the Ruddy Jive. Oosh. Um, so you fancied uh, uh, talking about sort of tr- truly ancient or prehistoric sort of megalithic structures in in Britain or all of Europe and how they might have been reappropriated through the ages. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. Oh, well, the reason I'm interested in that was not because I studied like Neolithic monuments at all. I'm not that particularly interested in them originally, but I was very interested in Anglo-Saxon paganism of the oh, right. you know fifth century sixth century seventh century and it become very apparent that the monuments that were important to them or that they that weren't very often not actually anglo-saxon monuments they were either well even not necessarily even celtic they were pre-celtic they were often bronze age barrows or neolithic barrows mm. that they had uh, appropriated into their mythology and um the more i learned about that uh, the more I realized that this wasn't some unusual and peculiar Anglo-Saxon behavior, but it's in fact the common human behavior throughout history in all different countries, whereby people consider uh, man-made mo- sacred monuments in their landscape to be sacred, even if the people who built them were a different people with a different religion. And very often those are appropriated into uh, the new religion and the, by the new people, but it m- sometimes requires um, a a destruction of a certain cultural taboo associated with the previous people or with the previous religion. And sometimes that amounts to a all out, out and out iconoclasm, like literally destroying monuments. But more often, I think it's simply about sort of uh, a- adjusting them to a new context and uh, fitting them into a new mythology. And, and that's why that becomes really interesting, because that's what we've been doing in Britain with these Neolithic monuments over and over again. Even in recent times, when you look at like modern history, modern historians in the 18th century or 19th century, having their ideas about what Stonehenge is hmm. fitting in with their ideas about of history as they knew it. And, you know, even obscure cults like the British Israelites who believe that the the British and Irish are some lost tribe of Israel well they went you know they're going digging up in the the um, hill of Tara in Ireland looking for evidence of ancient Jews living in Ireland because that they're trying to fit this into a a, a paradigm of their own you know religious and cultural worldview and that's a process that's just been going on and on and we can learn we can see so much about that with that knowledge in the archaeological record and in the historical record and also in um you know uh just in human behavior and also now more quite excitingly in like genetic evidence is showing us that there were huge population replacements uh in the, at the end of the neolithic there was a massive one and that's what people victorian archaeologists were theorizing based on the shifts in in like pottery um uh, but which has become which was later then you know archaeologists started saying that you know pottery pots aren't people this is not evidence just because pots change that there's a population change but now we know that the victorians were right actually there was a population change and then we can really start to understand what was this shift in the use of these monuments uh in the context of a population replacement right right so so one of the things i wanted to ask you again before we sort of really dive in uh, and i've had this comment from a few different people when when you get two people that are really into their history and they might leave an audience behind you might not even have a context so what I wanted to ask you about is sort of, you know, where um, inside the Holocene, of course, but where sort of the, the, the Stone Age becomes the Bronze Age, because you said your uh, interest was sort of the 5th, 6th, 7th century. My mind immediately goes to Sutton Hoo. Um, right. but, of course, but if we are talking about yet much more, more ancient times, for a lot of people, I think um, it's difficult to get their minds around it. So could you talk a little bit maybe about sort of the Beaker people? Is that what you were refer- referring to earlier? The beaker yeah, people. yeah. The, well, the beak of the beak of people, as they were known by archaeologists in like Victorian times, the beaker folk or beaker people, uh, 
and more recently in the 20th century, uh, it's actually been unfashionable to call them that. And you're supposed to say the Beaker phenomenon or the Beaker culture. But now I think with, since 2018, a paper by Alaudatul has made it quite valid for us to return to using the expression Beaker people because we realize they are a people. And they, the, the Beaker phenomenon, as it was, for, it was known in the 20th century, is a culture where, which involves the use of these uh, quite interesting bell-shaped beakers, which were used for drinking alcohol in some kind of communal setting. And there were also uh, status symbols that were included in their burials. So often when we find a burial of one of these people, they are the, the, at least the elites among them were buried with a beaker. Uh, of this kind, quite large. It's probably commun- we assume it's communal. They were like passed around because there's a lot of booze in one of these can fit in one of these things. But then again, mm. maybe they were heavy drinkers. It could have been just uh, uh, <laughs> just one person would drink from it. We don't actually know. But they were obviously important enough for them to be buried with their owners. And uh, the they start to show up um, around in, in Western Europe uh, uh, around the time the corded wear culture expands uh, through um, Central and, and Northern Europe. And the beaker phenomenon, it seems to be an offshoot of the corded wear phenomenon in, in Central and uh, Northern Europe that comes into Western Europe. And uh, in, it starts to arrive in Britain and Iberia and Spain around um, uh, four and a half thousand years ago. Oh, so and- much before the Bronze Age. Well, that's deba- that's debatable because I mean, Sorry. some people class the Bronze Age as in Britain starting at the moment the Beaker folk arrive, and others uh-huh. don't. Uh, but I, I guess I guess like the 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 it depends on like how much bronze has to be in use before you say the Bronze Age mm-hmm. has started. Um, but the Beaker folk had metallurgy from the moment they arrived in Britain. And the people who were in Britain before the people who had started Stonehenge, they didn't have metallurgy. So it, the immediately like immediate arrival of the Beaker folk in Britain and in uh, Iberia, it's an island. This is the beginning of the Metal Age. These people wore gold jewellery. They wore um, they had copper and bronze and glass and um, amber. Uh, which they got from Northern Europe. And those things you don't really see in Britain before. Uh, although the, the Neolithic people in Scandinavia obviously had amber before uh, the beaker culture arrived there because amber comes from around there. But um, the, yeah, like the trade networks open up, a whole load of different trade networks open up and British tin seem, and British gold and Irish gold start being exported out of Britain and Ireland a lot around Europe at the time the beakers arrived there. So it's almost like the beaker people knew that there was gold in them hills and tin in, in Cornwall and whatever uh, before they came. Uh, but the people who were there before uh, apparently were quite uh, oblivious to its value or didn't really care as much, as much about it. So the the four ideas we have about gold as a valuable metal were certainly existed among the beaker folk in some kind of way like they they valued metal um uh whereas they although they also still use a lot of stone tools they use arrowheads that were made of stone just like the neolithic people and uh i think that's why some people wouldn't say it was the bronze age yet because they were still using more stone tools than they were using metal tools uh but i personally favor the the beginning of the bronze age being classed at the arrival of the beaker people because it's so the arrival of metal comes with a people and that starts the Bronze Age, who these people are metal users. Right, right. But the original builders of Stonehenge were, were, were pre beaker The original builders of Stonehenge, the people who started it off, which was just the earthworks to begin with, like a long time before the beaker came, the beaker folk came, they were a different people. Yeah, they were more like, uh, they were quite related to modern day inhabitants of Sardinia. And they they were, you know, making all kinds of the megalith structures we see around Western Europe uh, throughout the Neolithic, the dolmens, the passage tombs, the stone circles. Mm. But the Beaker folk didn't always, the Beaker folk were interested in these monuments. They came and they made their settlements close to these monuments. And even a lot of the things that we consider iconic about Stonehenge were actually built by the the beaker folk 
For example, the, the main horseshoe arrangement in the center of Stonehenge, of the big stones, that was by the Beaker folk. So they, were, they came and they started moving things around and altering these monuments. Sometimes they would, um, you know, knock them down and change, and, you know, we don't really know why they were doing that. Sometimes they would add to them. Other times they seemed to be trying to hide the monuments, like the West Kennet Long Barrow, for example, they started filling it in uh, filling in the blocking it up this like it's a tomb that's not far from Stonehenge and they blocked it up and then started even in some of these tombs they start pulling all the bones out and pulling all the skulls out and chucking them away they don't want the bodies of these old people in there so it, you, some people will talk about their use of Stonehenge and continuing building megaliths as cultural continuity but I don't think that's really a fair thing to say because I mean if someone came to Britain now and they decided to use the same graveyards that existed but dig up all the old bones and chuck them out chuck the bodies and desecrate them you wouldn't really call that cultural continuity i mean that's a pretty strong break mm -hmm. uh it's, it's a kind of desecration and um th that's what we're kind of seeing so that there's a recognition of the the power of this place of these places that had been um that was based on the religious beliefs of the previous inhabitants but it's not a full-on respect and continuation of those previous religious beliefs. It's a kind of appropriation of their places of power into a new context. Right, yeah, so I mean, if we look at the site of Stonehenge as, as it exists today, um, would you say it's fair to, would you say that it's fair to say that it's, well, we're looking at um, a, a, just a piece of a jigsaw. It would have been a much, much, much larger site in the middle of, you know, that, that, that plain there in Salisbury and around Avebury. There's so many standing stones and circles and, and those. Uh, yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, and there's, so, there's so much around there. And do you think one small piece of a much larger puzzle? Yeah, like it is. A, it, what we're seeing is really the remains of the final arrangement of uh, a massive religious site and complex with several different religious structures built by two different distinct peoples with different religions whose religions somehow intersected with this religious area so and also much of the much of the religious many of the religious structures were made from perishable materials like mud and wood and they're not even there so the actual uh, landscape would have been covered in these religious monuments that aren't visible. And all we're seeing is the bare bones of the last arrangement of the stone parts and the earthen parts. So it's only a kind of glimpse of what was really going on. But um, we can certainly see that there was enormous uh, cultural shift by a pe the, pe the Bell Beaker people. All around Stonehenge, when you drive past it, you see these barrows and none of those were, uh, are the burial mounds of the, the original Henge builders. Those are all from the invading people who came uh, at the end of the Neolithic, the end of the Stone Age. But um, the original complex, that the people who made Avebury and Stonehenge, they, the, originally they were buried in communal mounds. And those are like West Kennet Long Barrow, which isn't far away either. And those are still there because they weren't entirely destroyed by the Beaker people. However, they were partially destroyed and messed around with. And some of the things that we've found more recently that to uh, in through archaeology to have existed in the local area that aren't so much visible, such as the Woodhenge, which they've tried to reconstruct, reconstruct, which is not right next to Stonehenge. And also uh, more recently, this uh, massive um, mega henge around Woodhenge. Uh, around Durrington, uh, that is probably dated to the time of the Beaker folk. So this enormous like religious complex, at least a significant amount of it might not even have been anything to do with the religion of the original people who made Stonehenge. It might have been part of this different religion from these other people. Uh, it's really quite hard to say, but the uh, it's just literally a glimpse into it. But what, what mm. we're getting a clear, I mean... The, the arrangement of the stones, for example, we can we can be sure that the pre-Beaker people did have a concern with the winter solstice because other monuments that are definitely long before the Beaker invasion, such as New Grange in Ireland, mm -hmm. that's aligned to the winter solstice. Uh, 
but then other parts of as i said parts of the stones have been rearranged and the avenue towards stonehenge is aligned to the summer sunrise the summer solstice sunrise so maybe that's nothing to do with the original builders that might be to do with this other religion um i, I mean it's it's a comp it's really complicated actually to figure out which is which and also even the way the, this complicated uh picture i'm giving assumes that these 1000 odd years of religious activity before at that site before the beaker invasion was all one religion which is a pretty big assumption because i mean you don't have to have invasions of foreign people for there to be religious changes like religious changes can happen domestically anyway mm. Mm. Yeah, I wanted to talk to you, ask you a little bit about New Grange. Um, but just following on from what you just said there, I heard one person give an analogy that say in 5,000 years, archaeologists dug up Westminster Abbey and they found both the bones of, um, you know, Edward the Confessor and Victorian people, um, that they would be confused as to, and they assumed it was all one culture. Um, and of course, they were very different. It was very different. But just on Newgrange, because Newgrange does actually predate Stonehenge quite significantly, doesn't it? And now and a couple of other sites, many, many sites in Ireland. But Newgrange, obviously, it's that, that big hill, like an artificial hill. But I believe a lot of that was reconstructed maybe in the 1970s. Is that right? And also, do you think that at one point, possibly, Stonehenge might have been a big hill like that and again as you say we're now just looking at the bare bones of it um well yeah i think that the the the, the earliest work at stonehenge is actually contemporary with the earliest work at new grange mm. but the earliest work at stonehenge is not is just an earthworks like a you know this mount like the big mounds so it wouldn't be like what we think of the stonehenge now um so that Stonehenge as a religious site is is not uh, much young. It's not. It's about as old as New Grange. But like when people say New Grange is older, I mean one of the ways that people sell religious sites in UK to like tourists is say it's older than Stonehenge, mm -hmm. which is sort of if they're saying that like yeah the the final arrangement of stones by the Beaker folk is only four and a half thousand years ago. So in that case, yeah, New Grange is a lot older than that. But, um, but like that's an unfair way of um, measuring it because there was religious activity at Stonehenge for a long time, a long, long time before that. Um, but New Grange was reconstructed in the 1970s. I think the chap who did it was called OK. It was controversial. Um, and some people have often said uh, that it's no good. I'm not really qualified to comment on whether or not it is a good reconstruction or not. But uh, it is a passage tomb of which there are many. And um, they, the tradition seems to have been that, I mean, the megalith tradition starts in northwestern France like 7,000 years ago and spreads all the way around the Atlantic coastline from up to Scotland and down to Spain. But within the megalith culture, there's all these separate traditions like the Henge tradition, which is uniquely British, or the passage tomb tradition, which appears to begin in the Valley of the Boyne with New Grange and the two other passage tombs next to it, which are Douth and Knauth. Um, and they are all um, very influential on Orkney. And it seems like visitors from Orkney brought that tradition back to Orkney. And um, and we know that there was big networks of like people traveling around the British Isles. For example, there have been evidence of pig sacrifices at Stonehenge, where the pigs have been all the way brought all the way down from Orkney. So Orkney, Newgrange, Stonehenge, these are like cultural religious centers to which people made big migrations and that the, the, the varying religious practices at these places were, were moved about the British Isles so that this passage tomb tradition was taken up to the Orkney Isles with, in, the, in the form of Maze Howe, which is uh, quite an interesting passage tomb. And like New Grange, it's under a big earthen mound. And that uh, um, mound um, is what we saw at New Grange, although that the reconstruction's got all these it's got like concrete it's used bits of concrete and obviously they didn't have concrete back in the ne neolithic but um i think it's fair to say that whatever new grange looked like it definitely was a chambered tomb that means like with a passage a, ch a passage made of stone leading into an earthen mound and uh and then also we can see variations of that in w many other forms such as the dolmen and the um <clears throat> the long barrow which is more more uh, reasonably located in like uh, Wessex.
Isn't it funny how so many of these sites are in extremely remote places? Like you mentioned Orkney up in Scarborough Bray and on the Isle of Man and Anglesey and some really remote places in Ireland and on Dartmoor, sort of really mm. windswept places. It's... It makes it very romantic, doesn't it? And I think that the explanation is quite simple. It's um, a combination of factors. One is that the, the materials used. So in those western, along that western parts of the British Isles is a lot of more... Um, there is a lot of stone available, so people were building stone monuments more. Whereas Eastern England, you don't see these megalithic structures because in the Neolithic there wasn't as they well they didn't have axe they couldn't import the stone so easily, and they, so they were probably building a lot more earthen and wood monuments. If you're aware of the topography of the British Isles, you know that the very best flat land is in is in like Norfolk, you know, cabbage farming central. And like if there was any, if I was a farmer, if you're an Anglo-Saxon farmer or a Celtic farmer or a Roman farmer and there's this thing in the way of this prime farmland, you're going to knock it down unless you've got very strong religious uh, taboo against doing so. So keep it nice and flat. Uh, so the farm and, and like there were obviously in the Neolithic a lot more tombs and uh, structures uh, of the sort we see in the Western British Isles all over Germany and Holland as well. But they're not there in, anymore because of you know the blue the blue banana uh, if, you know the industrial blue banana if you're aware of that which is this uh, industrial the first industrial zone in the world which stretches from you know the north the uh, England England's north and through the Midlands down to London and the southeast over to Holland and Germany and then curls around into northern Italy and that that zone is still the most densely populated part of Europe today and everything gets built over and destroyed. So there's not, it, whereas the Dartmoor, it's not very good for farming. Same with uh, the, the Western Isles, like the Hebrides and stuff. It's, it means that a lot of stuff gets preserved. I suppose the exception is the Salisbury Plain in UK, because that's actually great farmland, but some, something about Stonehenge just let people keep it, let, let name people leave it up there. Um, but uh, a lot of the other stuff has only been is only being discovered around Stonehenge now because it's been buried under farmland. Right. Uh, you said earlier on about that you were particularly sort of interested in in sort of the fifth, sixth, seventh century sort of Anglo-Saxon sort of high Anglo-Saxon period. Yes. Um, and and so I wanted to ask you about Sutton Hoo, of course, and, and King Radwald. I, I have actually been to that site once upon a time many moons ago, and those barrows there seem to be. Um, they were purpose built for that period. They weren't sort of reappropriating anything from an older period at the Sutton Hoo site, were they? No, they weren't. That that um, that barrow at Sutton Hoo is actually uh, a reconstruction as well. Um, but that's an accurate reconstruction. It's it's a it's a mound of mud. That's what a, an Anglo-Saxon mound is all about. But the Anglo-Saxons had brought that tradition to the UK. But it looks very, very similar to the Bronze Age Beaker Folks burial mound tradition. And that's because it derives from the same thing. The Anglo-Saxons were partially descent. I mean, the Beaker Folk of Britain came from Holland, where many of the Anglo-Saxons came from. And the Anglo-Saxon people were partially descended from the Beaker Folk of Holland and Germany and partially defend, defend, uh, descended from the Corded Ware culture of Germany and Scandinavia, which was also... Uh, very related to the Beaker folk and both of these cultures, the Beaker people and the Corded Ware people have their ultimate origins in the steppes of uh, Russia. And that, uh, that, that steppe culture had this ancient prehistoric like uh, tradition of round barrows uh, and it spread with a massive migration of people who spread the Indo-European languages across uh, Europe and Asia. And that's why we see this uh, this tradition of round barrows spreading um, into Britain, into Germany, into Scandinavia. Uh, but for some reason, the Celts in Britain stopped using round barrows so much. They didn't really like it. Celts in Germany carried on having, uh, you know, Celts in Central Europe had round barrows, but the, the Celts in Britain stopped using it. I don't know why. They still re they had a mythology surrounding the round barrows that had been left in Britain from the Bronze Age. Uh, they called, you know, the she in Ireland, they say, like the people, the people who reside within the barrows, the like magical people like fairies and things. Yeah. Well, the, the Anglo-Saxons brought this old tradition of round barrows back to Britain after. Uh, and for them, of course, the Anglo-Saxons seeing 
other round barrows in the landscape, such as Quickhelm's Barrow, uh, also known as Scutcham's Knob in Oxfordshire, <laughs> that's um, near where I grew up. And that uh, was, it's in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. They call it Quickhelm's Barrow. And they say how, you know, the Vikings met the Anglo's, tried to get to it. The Vikings tried to get to it because it was, you know, the center of England. And there was a prophecy that if the Vikings got to that barrow, that that would be that would mean they would never have to leave England. Um, but the, the the archaeological evidence shows that this barrow was not a quick helm. He was an Anglo-Saxon. It wasn't his barrow. It was um, it's a Bronze Age barrow. So it just shows that the Anglo-Saxons were building their own ancestral mythologies into the existing landscape to make this landscape part of them, part of their bloodline. Um, and that that's a process that we can imagine the beaker folk had done themselves with the ancient Neolithic monuments. And it's even one that the, the Anglo-Saxons did with the Neolithic monuments, like Wayland Smithy, which is also in Oxfordshire. That's a, a, that's a, um, a long barrow. And it's known as Wayland Smithy because that's, an, that's from Anglo-Saxon mythology. The blacksmith of the gods, who is an elf called Wayland, he is uh, allegedly resides within that barrow. And if you take your horse up there and leave uh, leave a quid for Wayland, he will um, magically put new shoes on it um, if you leave it there overnight. Uh, but the um, that's a, that folk belief obviously comes from an Anglo-Saxon belief that it look this this uh, long barrow looks a bit like this enormous smithy of a, some kind of giant or something. So they attach it to their their gods. And the uh, the phrase "enter ye work," meaning the work of giants is often used in Anglo-Saxon poetry to refer to the ancient megalithic monuments of Britain, um, which they assumed must have been built by some kind of giants, and giants are a part of their mythology. Yeah, that's interesting, isn't it, how uh, the, the theme of these circles, circular enclosures, whether they're a full enclosure or just a circle, um, that, that seems to be sort of truly prehistoric. I mean, uh, you must know a little bit about Gobekli Tepe. You must have seen that. I mean, those are in circles, aren't they? And so much of the, the carving that is on the sort of prehistoric or Bronze Age or pre-Bronze Age um, giant stones in Britain and Western Europe, there's so many of the iconography on there is in circles. It, that must just be um, innate in our nature or something. What do you think? Yeah, I think so. There was an old Victorian theory that was based on this idea of there was an invasion and replacement, which we now, that, that part of it's vindicated. But they had this erroneous belief that the invading race brought with them the circle as a sacred symbol, whereas the Neolithic predecessors had had a different, that didn't, they were more focused on rectangles. And, and this is partly based on the fact that the Bronze Age sees, you know, the prevalence of round houses, whereas Neolithic people generally built these longer house, communal housing, and that you also see the long barrows before. The Neolithic long barrow is very different from the Indo-European round barrow. But the, I, the fact is that the circles were also very important for the Neolithic people, because we can see all kinds of round things they were building, including the Henge monuments and New Grange and these passage tombs are all round. So it it was uh, it was obviously silly to it's presume that there was a culture that didn't have circles. Um, circles do seem innately very um, magical. I mean, anyone's just got to look at the sky and they can see a big shining circle there. It's obviously going to be influential on their on their religion. Yeah, it's funny though, so like you see, to hark back to Gebekli Tepe again, but you see, you know, just a circle of stones, whether they're aligned for astronomical reasons or not, or whether they're supposed to perhaps represent ancestors, uh, you know, we, we don't know, that's just right for debate. But the fact that so it seems the very first things that humans ever really put together was that um, all over the world, though. It's just, it is mm. quite surprising, isn't it? Interesting. Yeah, I mean... The, the megalith culture is, in, is, the origin of it was once speculated to be from the Near East. And that was a pretty good guess because, um, and the, what, what we know now genetically is that the megalith builders of Europe definitely had their genetic origins in the Near East. They came from Anatolia originally. And Anatolia is where Gebekli Tepe is. But I don't think we, there has to be a distinction between what we say a megalith, like Gebekli Tepe is a megalith, the megalith structures in Malta, which are similar to Gebekli Tepe, those are megaliths. But when we say the megalith culture, we're referring specifically to 
a megalith tradition building in Western Europe, which is very similar. Like it's the same exact one in Brittany, Iberia, Scotland, England. So uh, with some regional variation. And that is not um, a tradition that was brought from Anatolia, even though the people who who built them were themselves of Anatolian origin, because we don't see this transmission of that architecture going all the way from Anatolia through Europe and up to the Northwest. So it seems like the the Northwestern megalith cultures, uh, the megalith tradition started with the building of earthworks, not stoneworks uh, in Brittany. And then from these traditions of building earthworks, many of them circular, you get like the addition of big stones and then, and then people would keep on adapting it and adapting it. And a lot of them are actually, to, we know they're tombs. They're like the dolmen is a tomb, the long barrow is a tomb, the passage tomb is a tomb. The um, these are all ver the wedge tomb. Uh, well, their wedge tomb is probably beaker folk related, but the the court tomb, all these variations of different like piles of stones, basically, are actually ways of disposing with the dead. And stone hen henges are not necessarily uh, tombs, but there are prominent archaeologists who know much more than I do who who argue that they are that stone henges is, is some kind of way of of disposing of the dead as well and that it pertained to the world of the dead so maybe that that is too yeah it's interesting so you don't put too much emphasis on that they're sort of um used as uh, astronomical devices or um like for example there's the recumbent stone circle uh, yeah well I do think that the um there was obviously a an astro uh, astronomical element to the megalith tradition because for example the passage tombs like newgrange are clearly built with the intention for the mid uh, midwinter solstice sun to shine directly up into the passage and that is clearly deliberate and and uh, there's no doubt about that so they're conscious of midwinter solstice in that instance uh, in other instances we can see that there are things aligned to summer solstice such as the avenue at stonehenge uh, but but um, there are other stone circles which do not have any clear uh, alignment to any sun or moon. And the recumbent, the recumbent stone circle, the recumbent stone circle, as far as I'm aware, they they're uh, they're relating, they pertain to the moon, the passage of the moon. So the moon kind of travels over them. Um, so what that seems to indicate is that each monument has quite a different. Uh, if it does have any astronomical or you know, uh, lunar line, uh, like purpose, it's not necessarily related to those of other monuments. And we might be looking at quite different religious traditions at different monuments. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's really interesting. Do, do you think, could I ask you a little bit about if there are some at least that are connected to the midwinter solstice or a lot of them seem to be connected to the spring equinox? Um, just ask you about how uh, ancient people or uh, Bronze Age or before, how their lives were so much more closely related to nature and the passing of the seasons. Yeah, well, um, the megalith people represent the first farmers in the British Isles. So it's interesting that as soon as this people of Anatolian origin arrive in the British Isles and start building these monuments, they are uh, aligned to the start to the sun at different times of year. And these are the people who are farming and they're farming in a temperate region with seasons. And you've got to get those seeds. You've got to get that field plowed at the right time. You've got to get those seeds in at the right time. You're looking for a good season. And that's what paganism in, in the historical era, when we have sources, we can see that whether they're Romans or Celts or whatever, they're always very much praying for a good harvest because hmm. once you've got agriculture, that's really important. So, it makes sense that uh, this religion became obsessed with the sun, the seasons, once agriculture was the main form of sustenance. Um, the previous inhabitants of the British Isles had been hunter-gatherers who resided primarily in coastal areas and made good use of the, the, rich, uh, you know, the, the rich amount of seafood and uh, uh, shellfish that are available in our waters.
And uh, perhaps for them, that wasn't quite as important. I doubt they were that. I mean, they were close to nature, but they're not going to, you know, make a monument to the midsummer solstice um, because or midwinter solstice because the oysters are going to be there when they need their oysters or whatever. Like they're going to go shrimp fishing or whatever they want. Um, but uh, that that's um, quite interesting. And I think what we see with the shift out of the Neolithic religion and into the Bell Beaker religion, the Indo-European religion, is yet another religious shift. And although the, this one, these people were also farming people, just like um, the megalithic builders, they were very much more reliant on pastoralism. Now, pastoralism did exist in the British Isles before the Beaker folk arrived. In fact, there was a tendency already away from uh, sedentary agriculture towards pastoralism already starting some before the beaker folk arrived some people argue that's because of climate change had made it necessary for them to just you know rely more and more on uh, their on their their cows and their sheep and just driving them onto the moors in, in the summer we see that in the the beaker folks uh, uh, the archaeology they leave on the moors now where you get these like round houses that were only inhabited for some months of the year so they would drive their uh, herds up onto the highlands in the summer when it was good good pasture and then take them down somewhere more sheltered in the winter months and this we can imagine like okay you still have an uh, a consciousness of the seasons but it's more like about animal now animals and like crops are less important than herds and that like obsession with cattle as a symbol of wealth and power carries on all the way through the bronze age and iron age into like that's how into the celtic what sources we have that's how our celts in ireland define themselves that's what their main concerns are who's going to steal my butter who's going to steal my cattle and the vikings had the exact same ideas you know right up into the into a thousand years ago as recently as that and that that obsession with cattle is what led to the the viking settlements in greenland uh going uh falling to pieces because they insisted on cattle farming up in greenland where it wasn't really uh sustainable and uh, not very wise because the cattle themselves had this uh, symbolic value of power and wealth and giving up on your cattle would be was just not really possible in their culture. That's obviously going to reflect their religion as well. Like the the we know from the Norse religion that the primordial being which nourished the very first man was a cow. And this cow is like you know, like the mother cow of India, it's very sacred and important. And we can we can trace that like uh, archaeologists and comparative mythologists like um, J.P. Mallory and David Anthony, they have theorized that the original proto-Indo-European religion from which the Celtic religion and the Anglo-Saxon religion derived and even the Hindu religion derived from it. And this is the religion that would have been uh, practiced by the Belbeka people in the British Isles, that this religion had cows right at the center of it as a, as a symbol of wealth and as this kind of primordial figure of plenty and of, you know, of health and, and wealth. Right. Yeah. Uh, have you ever read uh, um, the, uh, Churchill's History of the English Speaking People? When right at the beginning, he, he talks about something which is probably really unfashionable, but he talks about long-headed people and short-headed people um mm. do you know do, do you know about that at all yeah well i mean i've not read it i understand that um churchill's uh forays into history are quite interesting and that he did consult some of the best people around at the time in, including uh, uh mortimer who uh, mortimer wheeler who i'm a, a fan of but the um uh, i haven't read it but this idea of using skull measurements to to predict population replacements was quite fashionable in um pre in the, the pre-genetic era pre-genetic science uh in 19th century and early 20th century and they used it to de determine that you know there'd been a population replacement now that became very unfashionable later uh, especially after the second world war for for obvious reasons but um uh what we're seeing now is that it's quite it's somewhat vindicated I mean, they, the, the change in skull, the, the Bell Beaker people, their skeletons can be identified by a different shape of skull. They were more robust and uh, what's called brachycephalic or brachycephalic. Uh, 
um, meaning they had more robust, round, broad skulls. And they also had flat occiputs, which is the back of the skull. And these are, both, these are features that you don't see as much among the megalith people. So yes, they, in this case, they were able to correctly identify a population replacement just by looking at the skulls. However, it's also true, and they didn't know that, what we know now, is that skull uh, morphology can change in a population over time without a population replacement. For example, we now today are exactly the same genetically as our bell beaker ancestors, but our skulls have started to change shape. And the same is true in Eastern Europe, where the ancient Eastern Europeans used to be more gracile and dolly cephalic, uh, meaning they had that long skulls. But now you see more among Eastern Europe, the broad skulls as the opposite of what's happened in Western Europe, where our ancestors were more broad skulled and now we're becoming more long skulled. So um, in that sense, no skull measurements aren't always a reliable way of telling ethnicity or, or population replacements in ancient world. Thankfully, we have genetic proper genetics to, to, to look at that instead. However, it's not fair to completely dismiss the Victorian uh, anthropologists and archaeologists who used that as a tool because they actually successfully identified some actual historical events with that tool. That's really interesting. You know the idea that, that there's been humans that are genetically the same as us or should at least uh, have the potential to be as intelligent as us for like maybe a million years and yet we see only the earliest stones, standing stones and things, are only, what, maybe 10,000 B BC at most. Do you think that's surprising? Do you think there, there are other structures that are just lost to us now? Or something happened, uh, without being too trite about it, something happened about 10,000 BC that made uh, hunter-gatherers start building giant mon monuments? Well, agriculture begins in, as far as we can tell, agriculture starts around um, hunter-gatherers in the Levant and in, the, and in Anatolia start farming wheat, sort of forms of wild grasses, a few like einkorn wheat, around like 14,000 years ago, something like that. Um, and that, you know, around this time we're sort of, like, it's still Mesolithic as far as most are concerned, but the Ice Age is over, it's warmer now, um, and the people in the Levant had the benefit of basically, it didn't actually start with them thinking, let's domesticate grasses. The first, they didn't have to, like there were people, there were hunter gatherers in Europe even collecting wild grass seeds and making bread. So bread precedes farming um, uh, and flour precedes farming. But like, obviously if you do this over time, you're going to start looking for the better seeds and maybe somehow it happened in the, in the near in the Middle East. They had the right seeds and the right environment that they could make. Um, they could domesticate some, and get decent, uh, you know, crops out of it. Mm. Uh, and, and then and like once you've got agriculture and a surplus of food that you can store and you start seeing this in early cities like in Jericho and stuff where they have grain storehouses then you've got basically you social organization at a higher level where you can start to do things like use the surplus, you know, accumulate surplus labor and direct it to the building of large monuments and things like that, uh, like Gebekli Tepe. Uh, that can't happen very easily. Usually, I, can't, I say usually that just can't happen under a hunter-gatherer society. But there are exceptions, such as the Jomon in Japan, who made quite uh, formidable, you know, large settlements with high organiza social organization without any agriculture. But that was because they had access to their very rich, um, biodiverse, uh, you know, uh, yields of the sea around Japan. So this was like they were harvesting enormous amounts of uh, seafood to sustain a large population uh, of hunter-gatherer people so that they could basically have a social organization at the same level as what we consider to be like typical of an agricultural society. But generally that's not possible for hunter-gatherer people. But once you get that, that amount of food and that, then you've got the social organization necessary for it, organizing it, you start getting hierarchies. You need a hierarchy that people believe in and will obey 
before you can actually get anything like a monument of that size uh, and you need to be able to feed the people it just seems maybe it just seems a bit funny to me but may, maybe it's not that there just seems to be no evidence of anything pre the last ice age and yet humans have been around for tens hundreds of thousands of years before that i mean you know there's like cave paintings that are like forty thousand years old aren't there in australia and, and in romania and some places so there's yeah. definitely people around for tens if not hundreds of thousands of years is that you can only assume we're capable of making stone circles or something and there just seems to be no evidence at all am i right in thinking that sort of well i mean yes humans have been around for a very long time i mean the uh, the, the humans have left africa well over a hundred thousand years ago precisely when is constantly being negotiated um, yeah. It was, I mean, 10 years ago, people said it, they only left Africa 50,000 years ago. Now we know that just isn't possible because we keep finding much, much older stuff. Like there's stuff in Australia from more than 50,000 years ago. Humans were in Australia already by then. And actually it looks like humans were in Australia maybe even before they were in Europe. Like Australia might have been one of the first places they got to after, as they spread along uh, Asia and out into Sahul. But um, the the picture of human history is by no means complete. And everyone is trying to tell a story of it with the little patches that we have. And they're constantly having to change that story as more and more evidence becomes available. But you can be certain that the story will change a lot more in the coming years because genetic science and archaeology are allowing for new things to be discovered. But um, as for building large monuments, it, no matter how long humans can live, uh, have lived outside of Africa and inside of Africa, it doesn't mean that they're going to start building large monuments because they we don't necessarily need to. You can look at hunt. We have people today alive, like in the Andaman Islands, uh, living at a, you know a basic hunter gatherer level, and they don't need, they don't make anything like that with any kind of stone. Why would they need to? All they need to be happy is a, a shelter, some and food, and their families. And they if they can build out of you know local grasses, mud, wood, then they'll do that. That's the best in most suitable material for their for their environment and uh they have they don't need to move to any other place and why should they they are quite content to stay living the exact same way for tens of thousands of years in the aboriginal and australians we we can tell from their mythology for example that they have records in their spoken tradition in their oral traditions of islands or of an island group off the north coast of australia uh, that was previous that has been discovered to actually exist and it's beneath the ocean and it m fell beneath the waves uh, over 20,000 years ago um which means that you know they have a quite a, a consistent oral tradition that lasts over 20,000 years and uh, the way of life for Australians uh prior to the arrival of Europeans in Australia probably hadn't changed in at least 20,000 or more, however long they've been there, 40,000. There's no reason for it to have changed unless uh, uh, unless their circumstances change. And we can also see this sometimes with the cave paintings you're talking about in Europe uh, from the Ice Age. Well, sometimes you see, you see, you go into the cave, like in France, and beautiful caves like Lascaux or, or whatever, Peshmel, and you see the mammoth here, a lion here, or some horses there. And then you find out that the dating, like one is 20,000 years older than the other. Mm -hmm. But that, you know, and they're right next to each other. So you're seeing a kind of cultural continuity that is unfathomable for us. Like mm. we're changing our spots every 10, every five years, everything completely changes. The music has to change, the art has to change, the clothes change. But actually, um, what, what, what's the norm in human history is cultural stability and, and, con and quite, you know, fixed stability especially in hunter-gatherer societies. Bear in mind, for example, that throughout the Ice Age, the entire population of Europe was no, was somewhere between 800 and 3,000 people. So very, very small amounts of people living, uh, you know, a very you know, simple life, just following herds of game and killing them and, and then painting in their caves from time to time. And that can stay the same for a very long time unless there's some impetus to change. I think the Mesolithic was the first shock when the, because when weather warmed, the populations expanded and the Neolithic uh, agricultural revolution was another, um, you know, in Europe, that's around seven or eight thousand years ago. That's when things really get kick started when then you can start having monuments like 
uh, of the kind you, 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 we've been talking about. It's not about them being more intelligent. It's about them having an organized society with hierarchy and, and religion that requires them to build these massive monuments. Yeah, yeah, really interesting. I mean, I'm not necessarily looking for sort of giant Sar standing Saracen stones or anything. I mean, do you know the um, the, the site of Nabta Playa, Nabta Playa in uh, extreme southwestern Egypt in sort of the Nubian desert, Namibian? No, Nubian, in the Nubian desert, um, which seems to be it's, it's pre-dynastic by a long way. Um, and it may be among the, the very oldest. And so it's a really small, uh, well, relatively small, sort of standing stones, or, or they, they think maybe it's also, well, it is almost certainly connected to astrology as well. Um, I, I think that might be one of the very earliest of these things to crop up. Have you heard of that one at all? No, I'm not aware of that one, actually. Okay, fair enough. Uh, do you think Do you think the Great Pyramid, we're getting off the, 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 the stated topic a little bit, but while I've got you here, do you think that the Great Pyramids on the Giza Plateau are, were appropriated by the sort of early uh, pharaohs and in fact are from a much earlier period? Well, now we're going well off my, uh, my area. <laughs> of I don't know much about Egypt at all, but uh, all I can tell you is what I know about um that the you know Egypt what people call ancient Egypt is a very large period with different dynasties and diff and the cult there were cultural changes with it from them but also I don't I think from what we can see in the genetic record is there's quite a lot of continuity of what this ethnic group was which is uh, a basically a Levantine people people quite similar to like Levantine populations uh, living in and they were living in Egypt and they were the ones who were responsible for this culture uh, throughout most of its time uh, up, up until and they constitute the majority of the population and the leaders uh, I think right up until the 10th dynasty or something but I'm I'm by no means an expert on that okay no fair enough fair enough G um, changing scene back to Britain then I want to ask you about Silbury Hill you know that's right near um, Stonehenge and, and and all that. You, you, do you know anything about that? You know that massive man-made hill. That seems yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. It well, uh, it's enormous. Yeah, I mean, some people say it could be a burial mound. If it is a burial mound, it's the biggest burial mound in the world. But there's no evidence that it is. Some people say it's a military fort, but it doesn't really look like a very good fort. So I mean, it's hard to tell what it is. It could be a, a variety of things. Uh, but uh, it's certainly a, a, a wonder to behold. Uh, I, I, and I'm sure like all kinds of mythology has surrounded it, probably assuming it to be the burial mound of a giant. But is it really a burial mound? I don't know. They should sink some uh, holes into it to find out, I think. Have you got a particular favourite site? Have you got like, you know, there's so many, aren't there? When you actually look at the map, there's there's so many like Ballow Wall Barrow and well Ireland is absolutely dotted with them the nine ladies the nine maidens the 12 apostles have you got a favorite particularly well I really love the one I mentioned already which is Quick Elms Barrow or Scotch Emma's Knob because that's just it's not that an, it's not that impressive a barrow uh, it's just a you know a, a bronze age barrow round barrow and it's actually been quite uh, plundered so many times over the years that it's quite uh, you know it's got a big depression in the middle and it's got these like skid marks from all the dirt bike uh, dirt bike users who try and use it as a jump or whatever but um, I love it because it's got all this mythology to the Viking Age and the Anglo-Saxons and you know it being the heart of England and because I grew up right down the road from it and spent many of my teenage years camping by it and I think that the presence of that barrow on the landscape even though I wasn't really that into history as a teenager I think just the the presence of it like was etched into my brain and to my you know identity as I am I belong to this landscape and that um, meant that we my friends and I often like identified with this barrow and we talk about going to it as a central meeting point and then when I get into history and learn about it I find out that it was used as a marketplace in the late medieval times it was used as a, a meeting point you know, by for all, for exactly the same reasons for hundreds of years, going from like the Christian Middle Ages back into Viking and Anglo-Saxon pagan times, and and all the way back to the original uh, to Bronze Age people who built it. Uh, that I find fascinating, and that tendency, that psychological tendency that I uh, I have of identifying with the landscape, 
is exactly how our ancestors identified with the landscape and and try to integrate the things that were around them these familiar like sites that they grow up around needed to be integrated into their worldview and into their world and their identity and i think that's really interesting yeah, absolutely. It's funny to think that um, truly ancient, really lost in the mists of time pathways that were used by these these uh, prehistoric peoples that then became then were uh, are still in use now. It's the exact same pathway, which is actually an A road now, and they pass through and alongside all these megalithic um, structures and things. And as we're talking about appro reappropriation, it's funny to see that when I did a bit of research for this, that some places in Ireland the standing stones and the, the like are so common that they're just in people's front gardens sometimes. Yeah. It, it's incredible to see, isn't it? Yeah, I think that's wonderful. Like, I mean, I, I, it's a shame when people, like a lot of the, you know, some of the sta standing stone circles and stuff are divided. Like they're, they're, it's a standing a stone circle might be in two different farmers' fields and the boundary line goes right through the circle. And that, But then like that's, you find out that that boundary line actually goes back a thousand years or something and then you, you can't you can't really complain about it so much because it's the boundary line is as much a part of our history as the as the stone circle so it's kind of um difficult to 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 say when when do we stop when do we set aside this and say this is a museum and we don't touch it because that's not what our ancestors did like maze how that five thousand year old um you know uh, passage tomb in orkney when the Vikings got to that a thousand years ago, they broke into it and then graffitied all inside of it with runes and pictures of dragons and stuff. And uh, obviously now if tourists go in there and start graffitiing it, then I would find that quite sad. But then again, I'm, I'm delighted when I see that 1000 year old graffiti. So it's quite um, a difficult sort of dilemma we have about, we need to, in, we still need to, we still use these things. These things are still part of our lives, a part of our landscape but we also need to preserve them. And that's something that isn't necessarily what our ancestors thought, this idea, this duty of preservation. Like usually if something's preserved, it's only because they couldn't be bothered to do anything with it or because they were afraid of it and they thought that they'd be cursed if they messed around with it. It's funny you mentioned Viking graffiti. I was in the Hagia Sophia a couple of years ago and there was some Viking graffiti there, I imagine from the 9th or 10th or possibly 11th century. And it was brilliant. I loved it. But the idea of me now carving something below that uh, w w would be a disgusting thing. And, but yeah, because the graffiti is a thousand years old, it's somehow brilliant. <laughs> I, I absolutely yeah. know what I'm <laughs> I'd like to go to the Hagia Sophia myself, but it's, yeah, I think it's because we now have this consciousness of history in a different way. We feel like we're, especially if you're a, hist a historian, you feel kind of like a duty of stewardship and holding on these things for the future so that they continue to last, especially when something's 5,000 years old, you think, this has to last. We have to make sure this lasts for the future as testament to like the antiquity of human civilization and of uh, and all, all the things our ancestors have done. Um, and I, I also think that I I'm I used to have a quite like negative view of these like hippies who go and like do these like made up religious rites at Stonehenge, but I've become I've softened to them now, and actually I I recognise that what they're doing is natural and is what exactly everybody's been doing for thousands of years, which is building new beliefs around ancient things. Uh, mm -hmm. And often like, you know, there's this cult around Glastonbury of uh, this feminist cult that came out in the 60s of the mother. And they erroneously believed that there was once a matriarchal religion with one uh, goddess ruling over everything and everyone believed in the supremacy of the female and blah 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 never actually happened but what they're doing is natural because that they were taking the emerging ideology of feminism and sacralizing it and integrating it with the landscape that was familiar to them and that process is a natural human behavior which i think um I, which i consider very interesting and and i and i like to see it happen although i don't agree with the the ideology behind that but even like when people want to go to stonehenge and they honor Stonehenge by bringing a sound system and having a rave that <laughs> that's obviously nothing to do with any of the religions that have existed around Stonehenge in the past but uh maybe that that new age religion has some validity and if it makes Stonehenge and that area remain special and relevant to 
those people, then then perhaps it's a good thing. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, absolutely. It's just a continuation of a new people not really sure what they're looking at or dealing with and just imprinting their own thing on top of it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. I want to touch you there, or the first half of the 20th century, how influential that period has been to um, sort of, you know, the way in the Victorian period or, the, or before World War Two, they would just sort of dig up loads of massive stones around Avebury and then re replant them in cement and things. And, and now it's like a World Heritage Site, so you're not sort of allowed to touch them or move them ever again sort of thing. And maybe a lot of what we see now in, in around Avebury and around Stonehenge uh, area is is actually a Victorian concept of what I think it should have looked like. Fair. Yeah, so the Victorians have, like us, they had that kind of feel, the duty of stewardship. They wanted to preserve and uh, look after these these ancient monuments. They love stone circles. They like to go and have picnics at stone circles. They thought they were romantic. Byron and Blake, you know, writing poems about druid circles and stuff like that. But um, and in, in a way, we can thank them because you know a lot of stone circles were starting to fall down in the nineteenth century due to new agricultural methods like better forms of plowing that caused different you know like drainage in the fe in fields that could mean that stones that stood up for thousands of years start to fall down uh, and they were you know putting them back up again and and they had that sense of duty to do so which wasn't a religious duty uh, but more just a sense of a civic duty like this is part of our landscape um, but the, in so doing they devalued some areas of history in favor of others for example, you know, they would find, um, you know, uh, a buried uh, long barrow and they would be trying to get get it on, you know, dig it up again, dig it up again. And they dig it up and they'd find that it'd been filled up with shards of pottery and and mud and rocks and closed up. And they're like, well, you know, open it up, open it up again. Let's have this tomb back open again. But what they didn't realize is that those tombs were closed up four and a half thousand years ago. By, a pe by the bell beaker people who were terrified of what was inside the monument and they were trying to you know close it up and this pottery and these things that they were like clearing out were were what we would now call you know archaeological evidence and really valuable stuff and they're just chucking it all out the way because all they were interested in was the, the original rocks that were put there in the first place um so you know they had very crude archaeological techniques compared to what we have now um but and they also, you know, they value things according to a different sort of process than us. Like we consider uh, our pot charts very valuable because they can be analyzed. We can see what was contained in the pots. They didn't know that was ever going to be possible. So often they just thought, oh, it's a broken pot. Well, no one wants a broken pot. So we'll only keep the pots that aren't broken. So we lost a lot because of, the, you know, the Victorian forms of archaeology, but also that. Victorian attitude is the basis of the modern, you know, historical method and modern archaeology. And everything we do is is based on what they started for us. And it, there are many cultures in the world that really don't and never valued history in this way. And it's spreading around the world to have this idea of like preserving the ancient monuments and that they have a value an, a, an actual financial value to the people who live in the area through tourism and through and through just general cultural heritage what that brings to a nation and that we, we you know we're in debt we're indebted to these victorian archaeologists even no matter how crude their methods were as a result mm. yeah no very very interesting yeah i mean do, do you think that uh, you, you know well it will obviously keep going don't you think that places well, there's, there's so many, aren't there? Like Stanton Drew, or in Caramore in Ireland's another one, or Maves Cairn. There's so many. Do you think that these things it will will keep getting um, built upon? Like I think maybe in ten thousand years there'll just be a giant steel framed glass and stone structure over the whole of the Stonehenge uh, site. <laughs> I hope. I hope so. I mean, I think yeah. that they that things can change enormously. Ideologies change so much. I mean. Even in the last 20 years, everything that people believe in Britain has changed so much. Um, so who knows what we'll believe in 100 years from now? And, and in that belief system, will, how will ancient things be valued? But no matter what they believe, they have to 
bring the environment, the landscape in line with their beliefs. And um, uh, even if the historical method as it now exists, like this empirical uh, and uh, civic sense of duty of preserving the past for, uh, acad for purely academic reasons, uh, that might not survive into the in indefinitely into the future. Um, but even if it doesn't, that doesn't mean that the monuments won't and they won't be uh, preserved in other ways. One of the best for ways that um, ancient things can be preserved is through religious reverence or, or taboos. Because if people are believe something to be sacred or cursed, they're often afraid to touch it. And if they're afraid to touch it, then they then it probably will survive a long time. And uh, that that can be very good for for the longevity of a, of a monument. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, was there was there anything else you wanted to say? I mean, because like you did say that you you know your speciality is sort of the Anglo-Saxon period. Was there anything I haven't really sort of asked, or you know, sort of a big theme that we haven't talked about yet that you wanted to? Um, uh, you know, you want to talk about? Yeah, well, I just wanted to bring home to people that that whole thing of like the the idea that like that round barrow tradition that I mentioned from the steppes that was brought all the way from you know Russia into the Western Europe around four and a half thousand years ago flourished in different forms around. Europe and the that the people who held it recognized that the earthen mounds of Western Europe sort of resembled their earth mounds. I mean, the round barrows were different. Uh, they were built in a different way and they had different rituals surrounding them. The megalithic, neolithic Western Europe people had communal, um, urn, you know, mainly urn burials, but also some skeletons. But it was mainly communal barrows and passage tombs. Whereas the newcomers often had this, the grave for just one person, uh, and it was always this circular hill, and much smaller. But they they recognizing a similarity, and then therefore bringing the mythology to it, but trying to kill the taboo associations with the previous inhabitants or, or the spirits of the, the ghosts of the previous people, and placing their dead into those older monuments and then you see that exact same process happen thousands of years later in Britain with the Anglo-Saxons coming in with the Vikings coming in where they're naming the ancient monuments after their gods and placing even Anglo-Saxons like a, at Slonk Hill there's an evidence of this where they buried uh, Slonk Hill just outside Brighton an Anglo-Saxon burial in Bronze Age and, and monuments Anglo-Saxons even buried people in Neolithic monuments that is a process that's ongoing and I think we should recognize it and integrate it with what we know about, you know, take what we know about Celtic and Anglo-Saxon mythology and what we know about the surviving landscape and recognize that our landscape, it should be sacred to the people who live in it. It's important that we, uh, that the average people, the layman recognize the sacred aspect of where he lives, that it's special and uh, he has a duty to preserve it. Um, and that we, you know, celebrate the cultural traditions or that the people spontaneously build around their landscape uh, in the form of folk culture and whatever, uh, in whatever peculiar way it might manifest. Because that's often that folk culture is what's going to make sure that um, the history is preserved in, in many cases. Yeah, no, yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Yeah, it's a really fascinating thing that I think... Um you know even though as enigmatic as a lot of these earthworks are um you know they're they're our, our deepest heritage aren't they so um uh, yeah obviously i'd love to see them preserved as much as possible yeah it's also that was in the news today in ireland that a lot of the the the, the, the monuments in sligo county sligo in western ireland uh, are being vandalized now more than ever before um and that that vandalism is perhaps partly due to an increased interest in the monuments more people are visiting them the vandalism consists of all kinds of different things from graffiti on inside the tombs people writing you know the year i was here 2020 or even taking stones from the monuments back home as a memento so sometimes actually like this increased passion and her for our heritage can actually be dangerous for the heritage because it's what leads to people doing this kind of stuff. 
Yeah. It, when you uh, come to uh, leave this uh, mortal coil, if you had some land and enough money and, and uh, permission, would you, uh, would you order a, a huge barrow built for your own remains? I would, I would actually like a, not a huge barrow, but a round barrow of like, like a, you know, like an Anglo-Saxon or a, a bell beaker one, which aren't that big. It's just a small lump of, uh, of earth, really. But, uh, but it's, it would be expensive depending on the where it was. But yeah, I would. But I think those were built originally in the context of like, first there was a pole erected and with a circle around it and then that was filled up with earth with a with a coffin at the middle of it once he the person died but um often in the saga the viking sagas and stuff the um the the, the guy who's buried in it actually built built his own barrow in his life rather than expecting his ancestors to go through with it but not always um but i don't know if i'll ever do that but there is actually for people who are more interested than the neolithic the Neolithic uh, style of the massive, you know, stone chambered barrows, uh, tombs like the, the, of the of the Neolithic people. There is actually a bloke somewhere in England who's made one uh, <laughs> that he that he can put your urn into it, and you rent a space in that um, in that tomb, which is open for people to come in and uh, leave flowers, you know. But it's communal, which is actually how the Neolithic people did stuff. So there's all these different other people strangers urns in there too and that's quite that's quite um that's not my preference i don't really like that sort of thing i prefer to have a, a distinguished barrow of my own but i don't know if i'm important enough to justify it <laughs> yeah i mean i i, I could go for a red world type thing a massive mock-up of something a huge vehicle or something and then the entire thing covered in a mound but uh, maybe that's just speaks more about me and delusions of grandeur i don't know <laughs> Well, yeah, if they did it, then we could do it, I suppose. And I, I and I mean, uh, there's, there's going to be a lot less. There's a lot of people in the British Isles, and there's not that much space for graveyards, though. So you know, it's going to be difficult for people to decide what to do. But yeah, I mean, I was thinking even about wh how many, if I should even open up a graveyard uh, my, of my own, building barriers for people, if there was going to be a big enough market for that. But it's very complicated because. Um, disposal of bodies in the uk is very tightly regulated because it can't be near any flowing water sources or whatever but uh, yeah all right well i mean i saw what your one of your videos from only not that long ago only about a week ago that was on all this sort of topic very interesting of course uh, uh, like what else have you got coming up at all are you allowed to divert uh, to tell us <laughs> um what have i got coming up well i um i have <laughs> just because i just finished the video i kind of like just have a, a lull for a bit but i my intentions are to i'm going to interview an expert on runes who is a modern uh, rather than being a historian he's a modern practitioner of rune rune magic and things so although my channel i'm a historian my channel does a lot of history videos where i'm just talking about what people did in the past i sometimes also like to talk to because i'm a historian of religion i like to talk to people not experts but just local like people who know about folklore or modern practices of, of of neo pagan kinds of religions that are based on old ones because then i think that gives us great insight into how people also used to think about monuments and things like that runes for those who aren't aware are like the the writing system that was used by the anglo-saxons and the vikings and it had a kind of magical significance and there are people in the 20th century, even back in the 19th century, who were trying to revive that magical tradition of rune use. So I'll be interviewing that expert uh, at some point in the in the near future. And um, I also have hopes to go maybe I mean, I'm negotiating with a, a certain group in Hungary to go and cover a, um, a festival about the steppe cultures and uh, i can film people performing you know uh, chariot warfare and th mongolian throat singing and all kinds of different like step related uh, things which i find very interesting so i might be making a trip to hungary in the near future yeah, well, cool I, I i'm partial to a bit of uh, throat singing myself <laughs> <laughs> very I, said, I was taking a piss but i'm not <laughs> Yeah, no, I am. Um, I've been I've been into throat singing music for nearly ten years now, and I'm glad to see like more and more memes about Mongolian throat singing which, because <laughs> it's actually great music. Oh, cool. Well, 
Well, um, I mean, if there was any other topics that you thought we could maybe talk about another time, I realise that connection's been pretty poor, which hasn't really helped with a sort of fluid conversation. But if there's another topic, maybe when I get a better connection, we could talk about it. I'd, I'd love to be able to pick your brain for a lot longer than this, but I appreciate you've got small children and, um, you know, uh, I have a bit of your time already today. Oh, that's fine, Bo. Yeah, I enjoy talking to you. I really listen, I enjoy your podcast. I listen to the Drake, the football, the Drake one, and a couple of the other ones. And I think it's really you do really good work. So yeah, I'd be happy to come and have um, a chat with you on a, on a, on another subject. If there's anything that I cover that interests you, uh, I'm happy to 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 return. Cool. Yeah. Thanks again for your time, Tom. Really appreciate it. Oh, 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 oh,